How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez and Lance Storm here. Figure Four Daily, November 27, 2020. Figure Four, online.com slash wrestlingobserver.com. I think maybe, at least for the first time since you came back, Lance, a free show. Free audio, wrestlingobserver.com. Free video, video.f4wonline.com. Lance and I do a show every week. And about once per month, we do a live Q&A, twitch.tv slash f 4 w video but today we are here to just do our normal show we got a bunch of topics to talk about and as always if you enjoy the show and you hear this in time hopefully you hear this in time friday night november 27 11 59 p.m soon as saturday hits the sale is over but if you get up there right now a full month of wrestlingobserver.com for three dollars and 99 cents and that gets you everything not just all of the Lance shows that we do from here on out, but if you subscribe today, you get all the future shows and also all of the past shows. Lance and I have been doing shows since what? 2008? 2007? Feels like Oof. a thousand years. Yeah, we, we had the, what was it, uh, eight-month break, I think, with my return to WWE. But, yes. Uh, yeah, it's been... Feels like decades, Brian, talking to you. It feels like <laughs> a thousand years sometimes, Lance. I wake up in the morning, your texts... But yes, every land show we've ever done, every Wrestling Observer Radio, which for sure we've been doing since 2008, and I used to have Dave on from 2005 on, so there's 15 years of Dave shows, 15 years of the Brian and Vinny show. Somebody added them all up. There are le- there are legitimately, this is not WWE WrestleMania 3, there are over 12,000 podcasts in the archives. There are thousands of issues of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter thousands of figure four weeklies you get all of it the new and the old stuff three dollars and 99 cents but you have to sign up before black friday ends on the east coast so i'm sorry if you're watching this for free on youtube on saturday hey you know what it's still awesome at 11.99 so it's yeah it's only seven dollars more yeah go sign up one way or the other at the end of the world yes i do want to make it abundantly clear that your 3.99 is for wrestlingobserver.com Podcasts, newsletters, audio, all of that. The board, God forbid, but you do not get the video service. The video service is separate. And unfortunately, we have not found a way to do any specials for the video service. So if you would like to watch the video versions of every show except Wrestling Observer Radio, that's video.f4wonline.com. And if you're watching it on video right now, I mean, it's all over the page you're looking at. So you can figure out how to sign up. But anyway, enjoy the show today. Absolutely free. If you like it and you have time, $3.99 for a full month of all of this. And Lance, as we always begin here, where in God's name are you? I'm actually at the University of Calgary in a lecture hall. Um, Lockdown is getting pretty bad here, so uh, getting out of the city, getting out of the country is getting really tough. So uh, I managed to snag a lecture hall at the University of Calgary uh, to do the show. Well, at least you appear to be socially distanced right now. Very much so, yes. It doesn't appear there's anybody else there. All right. Well, we got a lot to get into here today, including two tributes, I guess. We got we got Bob Ryder, Klaus Koroff. What can you tell us about both of them? Well, we'll start with Bob Ryder, who obviously most people would know. I first met Bob in ECW back in the OneWrestling.com days when the internet was still new. Um, I didn't know him well, but I think for the most part they just came to pay-per-views and they had a, I remember the OneWrestling.com banner. And again, for the my memories, that was, you know, the real first wrestling news website. Like obviously the Observer would predate that but as far as as a website to get news uh one wrestling.com and again back in that day maybe the law was a thing too but that would have been about it so i knew him from there and then i have a weird memory of him still being associated with ecw after i went to wcw where we hooked up for lunch at a cracker barrel uh in baton rouge of course you traveling did. Well, of course, yeah, that's where I would. But, again, I mentioned that online, and Mark Madden is like, well, he was with WCW that whole time. And I'm like, okay. But I remember there being, we joked about having to kayfabe it 
um, for the sake of, you know, company heat with somebody. And the only time in my career where I traveled solo was WCW because they, you know, they paid for my rental car, my hotel and stuff. So at some point in time in my career, I had lunch with Bob Ryder uh, at the Cracker Barrel in Baton Rouge. And then just because it's a funny story, I have no idea if it's true or not. I assume uh, I had heat with him uh, at the end, just in that, uh, again, I was obviously very outspoken, um, not always in a supportive way of TNA. And I got the impression he was not happy with that. And when I did the the agenting work in the guest ref spot for Impact Wrestling about a year ago, I think it was, um, Bob was the one that booked my travel to go to the TV taping in, in Windsor. And <laughs> I got my itinerary sent to me. And the travel he had me booked on was so bad, I called Don Callis and just said, Get me better travel or I'm not coming. He had me going from Calgary to Denver, Denver to Detroit, and then driving to Windsor from Detroit. And obviously there's, you know, Calgary to Toronto, Toronto to Windsor, or you could even just Calgary to Hamilton and drive down. But with that round trip, I would be clearing customs four times for a domestic television taping. And I assume, you know, he was either, it was either a good rib or it was a case of he got deals through American airlines and wanted to book me on American carriers rather than Canadian ones. But uh, I refused to clear customs four times for a domestic taping. So Don got my travel rebooked. And uh, if it was a, a rib, good on him. I'm certainly more than willing to take a rib. But yeah, he was a pioneer with, you know, internet and wrestling and, and booked a lot of travel for guys. So not a lot of close memories, but I certainly remember the guy and, uh, again, his contributions to, again, getting, you know, wrestling news on the internet back when the internet was still new and fresh. And Klaus. Yeah, Klaus Karoff. I first, uh, I would have worked with him in CWA Catch in 93 and 95. And, and it's it's funny how when you're young, um Older people seem really old, and then when you're old, older people don't seem very old. Because uh, I looked it up, because I remember thinking back that, you know, he was, you know, the old-timer on the end of his career, but, you know, older guy that, you know, physically couldn't do a lot. And I went back and looked, and he was basically in 93. He's my age now, and I don't consider myself an older guy, although I suppose I'm certainly on the, the downside of my career. But... He was a really good guy. We weren't close by any stretch because obviously he was much older than me and not uh, English wasn't his first language. And then again, with with uh, I think he was German. I could be wrong. He might have been Austrian. His gimmick was he was the at the time he was the stateless man. He he was neither German nor Austrian. I'm assuming to allow him to be a heel in both. But we always joked and had a good time. And the first time I worked him. Um, I think it was a tag, but again, I don't know this guy at all. I'm green as grass and just, you know, excited to go out there and work. And we get out in the ring and I tie up with this guy and he breaks into a tremendous Stu Hart impression. And it's like, I almost laughed out loud because a, I was green enough to not know that the Stu Hart impression was an international thing. I just thought it was everybody in Calgary. And I had no idea this guy had ever met Stu, knew Stu, but I guess I believe Klaus had done a run in Stampede. So it was funny. But again, he was, you know, a heavier set guy. And everyone was really set into their style and their ways and stuff. But again, Klaus was cool. And I was the young, high-flying, you know, do stupid shit for that generation babyface, doing flips and stuff. So he had asked me, you know, is there anything that we could do together? A spot, because I'd obviously done a bunch with Hero and other guys doing all kinds of crazy shit. And so I'm like, yeah, okay. So I thought of this, you know, it's a spot I had done, but I thought it'd be good for him where, you know, he, he can get some steam on me, send me in. I'll baseball slide through his legs. I go to kick him in the stomach. And if he catches my foot, if he gives me just a little bit of a, a bump with it, I can do a backflip and land on my feet. And then I can drop kick him. So I explained the spot to him. He's like, oh, okay, yeah, good. And we went out and we did it and it got a great reaction. And he's only got to take a back bump on a drop kick. So, so he liked it. And then that became our spot that whenever, because it was a tournament and you're there forever, you know, six months, we worked a lot. 
So whenever we would work, he'd always come over and he'd look at me and he'd smile and he's like, tonight. And then he'd pantomime that he'd point at me and then point through his legs and then pantomime catching the foot and giving it the boost and then touch his chest and, and fall back like he's taking, he wouldn't fall back, but he'd pantomime leaning back like he's going to take the drop kick. And I just say, yep, he's oh, okay. And he'd smile and, and that would be it. And we'd be good to go. And that was our spot. We always did it. And again, I don't know if it might have been fit, Dave Taylor, Tony Sinclair, one of those guys after the first time we did it, you know, ribbed and was like, oh, close, breaking out the new high spots. And it was just, it was the spot we did. And, you know, I, I did a write up as I usually do with, with people that I knew. And it's like, it really reminded me thinking back of Klaus that. What I really love, past tense, because I'm not on the road anymore, but what what I love about the wrestling business in that here's two guys that never in a normal life would ever meet, were 30 years apart in age, were from different countries, don't even really speak the same language, have zero in common, but in that building and in that ring, we're like, we're friends and brothers, and we enjoyed our time together and had fun. And as much as my first run in 93 was tough because I was homesick and not used to being on the road that long, thinking back, that time in CWA catch, because everyone, because you spent so much time together, you were so close. You saw each other every single day. And again, in many of the places, you're all living in the same area in your, your caravan trailers that you become a real family. And Klaus was a happy part of every day, just seeing him and saying hi. And I shared on, um, on again, all my social media platforms. I hate that phrase, but that's what it is. Um, two photos, one from, I think, again, I could be wrong. I think the, there's a black and white and a color. And I think the black and white is from 93 and the color is from 95. Although after looking at him, I realized he's wearing the same pants in both photos. So he either had the same pair of Zubaz pants over two years, or I've got it wrong. And the both the photos are both from the same year. But um, he was a really nice guy. Again, I, he uh, I think he was 79 when he passed. So at least it's not a really tragic early death, but still um, just a really fun guy. Super fun to work with. And I... Uh, Got a little choked up writing up, right to doing the write up about him, and and I'm going to remember him very fondly as one of the the great funny characters I got to meet and work with in my career. You know, it reminds me of when I watch matches nowadays. It's just not it, not everybody, because I mean, some people some people work the old style, but I mean, a lot of the newer workers, probably anyone, I don't know, I'd say 35 and under, because I'm mostly thinking of the young bucks. I mean, I'm reading their books, and they're talking about this match they had, and it might have been one of their early PWG matches, but the comment that they made was, this is the most we've ever had to memorize in a single match. And, you know, I even remember when I went to King of the Indies, I will never forget this because it's so ironic in hindsight, AJ Styles was working King Indies, and he was in the ring for like seemingly five hours going over his match before the show. And I was just, it was completely alien to me. And then, of course, you know, years later, we interviewed him on the website. And he basically talked about how, did I go to New Japan and, like, the Young Bucks, they got all these 80 million things they want to do. And I'm like, dude, I can't remember any of this. So just tell me only what I need to know. But when you tell that story, it reminds me that, like, when I used to work with Buddy, it was the same thing. Like, we had, we had a couple of high spots. One of them was always like, he goes for the power bomb. I turn into the face first DDT, and then I go up to the senton. And it was like, it was our finish in almost every match, as long as we weren't working the same crowd or whatever. But the rest of it, it was just you went in the ring and you called the entire thing in the ring. And he would always tell the story about when he was in the Maritimes with Chono. And, and him and Chono worked like 30 straight days with each other every single time in all these different towns. And they had their one high spot. And Chono could speak no English, but he could say high spot. And so yep. they would just be, they would, they would call in the ring and then finally Chono would say high spot and they would do their one high spot and they'd go right back to doing whatever they were doing. That's the way that it used to be. And I just, when I was a kid, I would watch wrestling. I think every kid that got into wrestling, they watched wrestling and they thought I could do this. You know, it looks like fun and I can do all the moves. It looked like something that you could do. And then obviously when you get into it, you realize it's so much harder 
But then, like, one day I found myself watching these matches, and I'd been a wrestler, and I watched these matches, and I just thought, I could not do this. Like, I can't. <laughs> There's no way I could do this. Like, if I had to have a match with, you know, me and you or me and Vinny or whoever, it'd be a horrible match if it was anyone. But anyway, if we were facing the Young box, It'd be better if it was you and me than you and And Vinny. we'd, like, have a TV main event or a pay-per-view main event. It's going to go 25 minutes. Like, dude... Three high spots is maybe the most I could ever remember. It's just never what I did. I could never remember all of this stuff. So it just is amazing how things change. But I do love the story of there was always that one high spot. That was like you and your buddy's high spot. And you, whenever you worked with them, that was like your high spot. And it's true what they say in wrestling where, you know, you'd meet these people and you'd only ever see them in wrestling. And like, you know, for me, I used to always go to Canada and so these people, for sure, I'd only see at a show because I'd never see them around town. They live in Canada. But all you would you would only know them from wrestling. But it was like you knew them your whole life. Like my buddy Sonny. I mean, we had 50 matches together, maybe. And that was the only time we ever saw each other. And I haven't seen him in probably well over a decade. But I just know that if if we were in a supermarket and Sonny was there, like we would hit it off like we'd been together our whole lives. So anyway, that's my reminiscing for today. Yeah, and it, it was it was weird in Europe, and it's funny too because whenever I hear Dave talk about it, I, and a lot of times I think he gets it wrong because he talks about how you know the fact that you're in the same building every single night, you really had to work about changing your stuff up. And I found it the opposite in that I was amazed how little many of the guys change their stuff up, and the crowds seem to very much like you know, the guys doing their regular stuff. And the one thing, because I want never, you to play the hits. Yeah. And I never liked doing the same match over and over again. So what I found, because it was easy, and again, that spot was my Klaus Karoff spot. And when I worked with um, Colonel Brody, he did the South African gimmick. I think he was British, but he did the South African gimmick. We always had the mind of the watch spot. Because it was the, you know, he'd get me in a test of strength and I'd boot the one hand free and I'd do the run up the corner and then jump back in and give the arm drag. And when we did it, I don't know if it was the first time, but once we did it that way, then he always did. We set it up the corner that I would send him because he'd take the arm drag and he'd slide out of the ring. And we always set it up so he'd slide out of the ring onto the timekeeper's table and land in Manfred Cox's lap, basically. And whenever he Excuse bumped me, did out, you say Manfred Cox? Uh, Manfred Cox, that was his name. I think it was K-O-C-H. Hmm. But Manfred, he'd always land in Man and Manfred, you know, because there's rounds, so the stopwatch is important. It's not just so you know that the match was, you know, 15 minutes long at the end. He's got to time the rounds and give us the cue when the, you know, we're getting close to the end of the round. So whenever Brody would roll out in onto the timekeeper's table, which was against the apron, Manfred would always grab his stopwatch and go, mind the watch, mind the watch. And so Brody and I called it the mind the watch spot. So whenever I worked with Brody, he'd just look at me. It's like, mind the watch. I'm like, yep. And we'd do the mind the watch spot. When I was with Klaus, we'd do the other spot. And I pretty much, because I like to do different shit, I'd have my, say, 15 different spots. And depending on who I was working with, I would do the one that they knew. And that way they'd only have to remember the one spot that they did with me. Um, where again, just sort of on the, having to remember a bunch of stuff. Um, there was, I think it was 95. They, every Friday they started doing Iron Man matches cause they needed to change things up. And at first, I think they were, I think they first, they were going to do it like best of seven falls or some crazy thing. Uh, but then it just ended up, it was only a 20 minute Iron Man match. Cause again, you usually had, you know, five, four minute rounds. I think championship matches were three minute rounds. So going 20 minutes with no breaks was like Iron Man for, for Europe. But unfortunately, Otto booked that before he realized that a lot of the bigger, heavier guys didn't do well going 20 minutes straight through. So every Friday, it was just miraculously booked that Fit Finley and I were in an Iron Man match. So Fit and I would always do the 20 minutes on Fridays. Again, heaven for me. I loved working with Fit. But we'd have usually like five different finishes. And the finish would usually, you know, a couple counter, counter, counter into something, and we'd do the finish. So we've got like five finishes, all that involve five or six little things to do them. And because it, 
it wasn't a real memorize a bunch of shit territory. Usually you'd have the finish and maybe a, maybe a high spot. And Fit and I worked together really well and we would laugh because there was some, we'd go out there and we'd come back through and it's like the finishes had all come off great. But we'd realize after the fact that we didn't get any of them right. Like we'd start going into one, but then would do part of the counters into the second one and eventually hit the fourth finish. And we just managed to go with each other the whole way. And if it was, you know, supposed to be a duck this and the guy didn't duck, we would do whatever was part of a different finish that didn't have a duck. And it's like, I don't think anybody ever thought we weren't on the same page. We got through all the finishes and had a fun match. We'd get to the back and just like, it's like, did we get any of those right? And he's like, I don't know. I'm like, all right, well, it was fun. So thanks. See you, see you on Friday. Um, and it was just, it was just it. And, and, you know, you, you talk about the, and I've done it where I go, you know, um, watch, you know, watch indie matches or when I do a guest refs, whatever. If I'm at a show, the amount of time people, you know, spend in the ring laying out their matches and walking through stuff or practicing stuff. I like, I'm just dumbfounded. And I can do a match where there's a lot of memory work for sure. I've done, you know, a match with a 10 minute finish once. But the matches I enjoyed the most are the ones that I have the least planned. And I always remember, and I've only watched it back once, and it was, you know, it was a fine match. It wasn't, you know, I wouldn't give it five stars, and it wouldn't be one, it probably wasn't even my favorite match working the guy. But I worked Chris Hero in Toronto at a Smash Wrestling show. Chris had a disastrous travel day. He had his rental car broken into, his passport stolen, he had to cross the board. It was a disaster. And, and dude gets there literally like, you know, a minute and a half before we have to go to the ring. So we put together, like, literally, you know, this is the finish. This is the near one near fall before it. We'll figure everything else out, see you out there. And we just went out there, and it's like we did a bunch of stuff we never would have done had we sat down and planned shit. And it was just so nice to go somewhere you didn't plan. And it was fun, and it always kept you on your toes because you never knew what was there. And that's where, again, I don't like the, you know, hey, I, I didn't like it in Smokey when we did it or anywhere where it's like, hey, we've got, you know, 10, 10 days on the loop. Let's just do the same match. I always found I got bored and the match didn't look as real because you could tell I knew where the guy would be and what I was doing and you'd get comfortable. But when you have no idea where you're going, I just found you always paid attention more and I liked it more. Well, for those of you that are listening to this for the first time, Vinny and I and my buddy Craig, we review all of the... Well, starting about six years ago, we started reviewing Nitro and Raw. We did the entire Monday Night Wars. Every week we watched Raw and Nitro, we reviewed them. We went all the way through the bitter end of Nitro, and it was bitter. And everybody was sad, so we decided, let's keep going. <laughs> we'll review the invasion we're gluttons for punishment because we're quite frankly as i noted this invasion i mean nitro never ends and we're currently about two weeks away from the invasion pay-per-view and literally the tuesday show we just reviewed was where ecw debuted and they teamed up with world championship wrestling and merged all in the span of 45 minutes on one episode of Raw. <laughs> Craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. Lance, you were there. I was. And before we get to that episode, I want to mention back to Tacoma. Because I had mentioned to you that my vivid memory of the Tacoma Dome tapings. And it didn't air on Raw or SmackDown. So I'm guessing it had to have been dark. But we had a segment in Tacoma because everyone... Again, WWE in particular, but everyone was mad at Buff. Uh, there was the bad match with Booker and Buff, but Book the next day showed up with, yeah, that sucked. And uh, Buff showed up with, uh, no, I don't know, everybody's got it wrong. It wasn't that bad. I watched it back and, and made excuses. So Buff had heat. To everyone be fair, was, it wasn't that bad, but it certainly was nothing resembling good. Buff was blown up in a minute and a half and grabbed a two-minute chin lock. Well, he bad. sucked. And when you consider how fast the pace and the action of Raw was at the time, it was bad. But the next night, I believe it was the next night, there was a segment, and I think it was a, a, a tag match. Maybe it was a, you know, again, they used to do dark main events occasionally. Maybe it was, but I think it was a tag or something. I thought it involved a mass run in anyway. 
But the gist of it is, it's like, you know, Paige is going to the ring and Buff's going to the ring and it's the big schmas. All the invasion guys go to the ring and then APA runs down at the end. And we're all supposed to, you know, bump, get the hell out. But Buff is the one guy that's not supposed to be able to roll out of the ring. And Buff is supposed to take a power bomb from John and then the spine buster from Ron. And it's his receipt. And I remember standing behind the curtain at the Tacoma Dome when the segment's starting, getting ready to go. And Ron and John come up to us, and it's all, you know, all those WCW geeks. And they just look at us, and he says, if that son of a bitch rolls out, you guys better throw him back. And it was like, it was a real watershed moment in that this is where we have to decide, are we on Team Buff or are we on Team WWE? And that was an easy team to pick, and we're like, don't worry, he'll go back. <laughs> and to Buff's credit, he didn't roll out, but he took the power bomb from John and John planted him, but John planted him flat. It's so one thing I will give John. He's planted my ass in, on, in the mat really super hard too, but he's always put you down flat. So it's, it's safe. Even if it does knock the wind out of you and, and, and go thud real hard. So he plants him with his power bomb and then buff fakes an in injury and won't get up. He's laying on the mat. Like he hurt, hurt his neck. And I can till to this day, remember vividly, Ron standing over with, get that son of a bitch up. And it's just like, oh shit, dude, he's going to pick you up and he's not going to be happy now. It's like, you should have just took them both, never said a word. And when you got to the back, just shake their hands and say, thank you. And it's like, his heat might have dissipated. Now, granted, the next weekend, he no-showed the host shows and we got the Atlanta show. And I don't believe we ever see Buff again, but I, I think he could have quelled the heat if he had just took his licking and... and uh didn't sell it and didn't complain. Now, as far I actually as did not go back and check, but the the SmackDown after Tacoma ended with the big brawl outside with all of the WCW guys fighting. Yep. So it may very well have been that they ended that show with the brawl outside and figured we got to give these people a match. And it was that dark segment where Bagwell took his beating because it wouldn't have been after Tacoma. It would have had to have been either SmackDown or I guess the Raw we just watched. But I, I, I presume it was a SmackDown show. It, it it had to have been... It was Tacoma, so when it didn't It would be on, SmackDown then. Yeah, so when it didn't air on SmackDown, I'm like, when the hell did this happen? So I'm assuming it had to have been dark. Now, on to the Atlanta Raw. That was also... Because, again, Buff no-showed the, the house show loop, but was there at TV, and I remember being there. Because it was the incident, if everybody remembers... Um, we were training at the tracks facility so all us WCW guys could get used to the WWE ring. I was trained in a 20-foot ring, so I didn't need to get used to anything. But there was two rings. I was in the one ring with Fit and the women. We were training with them, working out. And the guys were in the other ring doing whatever they were doing. And then there's this commotion. And Fit and I look over, and Buff's on the, the floor holding his head, and he's bleeding like a stuck pig. And everybody's like, what the hell happened? And Buff, to his credit, just said, oh, I, you know, I banged my head against the apron here. It's no big deal. And I'm like, all right, whatever. Found out afterwards that he and Hurricane had been jabbing back and forth, you know, insults and taking jabs at each other. Wait a second. To his credit, he lied? He didn't stooge off Hurricane and say, Hurricane I hit see. me and be a baby. He I see. He didn't okay. want anyone to get heat. So he just went, oh, I slipped and banged my head. But they were throwing jabs, uh, jabs back and forth, and Hurricane had a bum shoulder or something, so he had a frozen water bottle on his shoulder. And they're throwing barbs back and forth, and I guess Hurricane, no surprise, got in a really good one that hit too close to home. And I think, again, I'm just going by what they told me because I didn't see it. He hit his barb, you know, and, you know, did, was doing a walk-off or whatever, and apparently Buff smacked him in the side of the face from behind. And Shane instinctively spun and went to hit Buff and had the frozen water bottle in his hand and hit Buff in the head with the water bottle and busted the top of his head open really bad. So there's blood everywhere and everyone just vows to stick with Buff's story so we don't get in trouble with the office, that we get in a fight at the track facility, we got enough heat. But anyway, he no-shows the house show loop and... In Atlanta, I see him backstage talking to Jim Ross or whatever, and I hear him explaining that, yeah, you know, mom thinks it's infected. We have a doctor's appointment. 
And I remember thinking, it's like, we have a doctor's appointment? It's like, what's mom having checked? And I just laughed at the, the, always the absurdity on how Buff always talked about him and his mom. It's like, he couldn't just say he went to the doctor. It's like, we went to the doctor. Mom thinks my head's infected. So that was his excuse for missing the house show loop. And then obviously we had the, uh, the big ECW thing. And you guys really did a, a disservice on the BVNC show. You got sidetracked and never actually described the segment and what happened. You just said it did. Because to me, it was the most successful segment of the invasion, possibly, that, you know, uh, Mike Awesome and I are, Mike Awesome, RVD, uh, Dreamer and I are beating up those guys, and then all the WWE guys hit the ring, you know, the Dudleys and Raven and Rhino. And when they get in the ring, there's that really great visual moment where those five guys are staring down, you know, us four guys, and they're protecting Jericho and Kane. And then there's that moment where they just turn, and you realize that all nine of us are actually former ECW guys. And the crowd realize it. They react big. We beat them up. And then Paul gets in the ring and cuts the the fiery, extreme ECW promo. And it's like the crowd was hot. And it's like it was really the first moment that it felt like, shit, this invasion's working. And Paul obviously just, you know, shit-eating grin, strutting like a peacock because, you know, the, the WCW thing wasn't really working. But this ECW thing's working great. But I remember, too, because, again, the, the main event segment, 45 seconds later, when the alliance is formed, the ECW guys came through the crowd. So we had to go through the back of the arena and take an elevator up to the, you know, the concession deck or whatever so we could come through the stands. And we're in the elevator, and I'm with Paul, and Paul's, you know, just chest, you know, like doing the Vince McMahon thing because his shit's working. And I just look at him like, you realize as soon as we join the WCW guys tonight, this is over, right? And he just sort of looked at me and he's like, yeah, you're right. And it was just like, we were both resigned to the fact that as soon as they add the WCW guys to the mix, it's like, it's going to feel like the old invasion again. And it's not going to have that same vibe to it. But, you know, you, you said it best. It's like, in hindsight, it's like WCW and WWE should have gotten a year out of that sucker. Are you kidding me? But it, even if it was six months, but a year to six months of that sucker, and then as soon as it feels like WWE is finally going to get the better of WCW, then this angle should have happened, where the you know the WWF ECW guys defect to ECW, the two or three ECW guys in WCW defect, and we could have done ECW versus WWE for another six months, and then as it looks like. WWE is just finally going to get the better of the ECW guys, then the Alliance. And then it's like both of us team up to go after WWE and get like another six months to a year. And instead it happened in what? Like the course of three months was all three of them. And it was just, you know. Three it's months? It was the course of a month it was all three of them. Well, no, but I mean from when... From when they, I, when they, I super kicked somebody to when the invasion was over. What was it? Six months? It was. It was May through November. So May through November. So yeah, it was just. It was. It was just so amazing how quickly it went through, and how we were excited. And it's funny too. I'm assuming it'll be, might even be SmackDown, might be this week or might be next because the next big promo. Because I thought it was this one, but it wasn't. There's a big promo where Paul does it in the ring with all of us. And one of the segments, I think it might have even been, oh, I haven't talked yet, so it's going to be a segment pretty soon. But when I talk, the first promo I do, Brian Gewertz has, you know, because I'm going to be the, you know, I don't do the pyro, the ballyhoo, I'm about wrestling. And he's got this verbiage, and it's like he can't think of another word other than wrestling for me to say. And he's like, we're not allowed to say the word wrestling here. And I'm like, What? And he's like, let me go ask, maybe just you this one time because of who your character is. He'll, he, you know, Vince will okay saying wrestling. So he leaves and he comes back. He's like, nope, can't say it. So we come up with something else. And then that night 2001. Is, yes. And then later that night or the next show is the big alliance guys. And Paul's cutting this promo and he's saying wrestling and wrestler and wrestling and, re and I'm sitting there going, oh, shit. It's like he's getting away with it. And then the very next show, Paul never talks again, and Stephanie McMahon is the voice of the Alliance. Good and I'm God. like, oh, 
I guess he wasn't allowed to say wrestling either. So um, it's funny looking back, though. I would have sworn and bet the farm that me and Awesome against Jericho and Kane was the first true, authentic, interpromotional match on television. But the Booker versus Kurt Angle was in like the segment before it. I yeah. I I would have swore it was the Fucking other order. Unannounced. Yeah, unannounced Out WCW title nowhere. match. Dude, it's painful to watch because I mean there are moments from like the day that you appeared to do the super kick and you can just see all oh, these fans. Like, they're so into this. But they keep just fucking everything up. And, you know, I talk about this all the time, actually, with AEW. Because the way that they book is... It's different in the way WWE books. And whenever there's, like, a championship match coming up... It's because they book WWE rights. Basically. When I when I watch, like, Drew McIntyre and Randy Orton. Okay. So that match is coming up for the title. And when I try to figure out who's going to win, it's like, fuck, I don't know. I mean, Randy just got it. Are they going to 50-50 it? I mean, that's the kind of thing that I think about. When somebody asks me, who's going to win Kenny Omega and John Moxley? All I think about is, does it feel like it's time yet for Moxley to lose the title? Because I remember that from wrestling. That's all Buddy used to always say. Anytime we did an angle or a match or whatever, I'd always want to know everything. And his answer was always, when it's time. Okay? So I watched this fucking invasion. And, like, the first thing you think is, was it time for ECW to invade? <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? And then, was it time for ECW and WCW to combine? No! All of this happened in 45 minutes. And you just think about, okay, yeah, it was a week after Tacoma. I realized the match sucked. I realized the fan <laughs> turned on it. But fuck, it was one night, one match in Tacoma. And ironically, I realized that they did crowd sweetening and everything like that. But if you watch the very next SmackDown, dude. It was fine. It was fine. What in the fuck did we panic like this for? Well, when you think of because you just mentioned, was it time for the ECW invasion to happen yet? I don't know the number of the segments, but if Seg 3 was the very first WCW versus WWE match ever, the very next segment was the ECW invasion. I know. <laughs> the it's next, just... like, well, we got that one match out of the way. Let's move on. And it was it was just crazy that um and that was it though. I believe it was a case of the panic of WCW is failing based off one match with Booker and Buff. And it was like they need reinforcements and it was it was ECW and it was just like can you imagine if instead of Dreamer and Ray, uh, RVD running in at that moment it was Goldberg and Flair? Oh. <laughs> it was like that would have been a better uh yeah because if it, it, it's 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 a shame because it could have been so much and it did good business even as it, it was did great business even though it was the most rushed fucked up horrible storyline it still did gigantic business and you yeah. just think about if they'd done it right what kind of business would this have done it's crazy to think about. They go, oh, well, you know, we can't bring in Goldberg. We can't bring in Flair. I mean, their contracts are so high. It'll upset the salary structure. People will be mad. It's like, come on. You would have brought those guys in. That invasion pay-per-view would have grossed so much money. It would have made so much money. Then you go on the road. Everybody's making more money. I mean, it's Can madness. imagine Austin Goldberg sellouts and house shows everywhere dude that would have been nuts madness all right well we got to go to modern day here and Alrighty. aw and any nxt thoughts um biggest one and i try not to spend too much time on it because we got really long on the other one but the tony storm turn which again i didn't watch the show i just watched that segment because i've mentioned before i there's only so many shows i can watch but 
I'm a big fan of Tony Storm, but it's it's like it was actually Lance exactly like what you were just talking about. With it wasn't time. <laughs> no, but I mean not just that, but it was the exact way that you described what happened when you and the ECW guys all of a sudden turned and faced each other. It was the same thing. Someone ran down to make the save, and then they turned. Well, this is where it's something that annoys me in that a I, I turns are done so poorly now. And we'll mention it in AEW, because I thought the Hobbs one was pretty decent. But there was no motivation for Tony to turn. Zero. Zero. And then also, too, it's like, if her motivation is to beat up Ember, she could have just ran down and beat up Ember. So the run down, stand her up, hug her, let her run in so I can pull her back out. Like, why? Like, if you wanted to beat her up, just beat her up. It's, it's the Vince Russo swerve. And I think it's just a case of it's been done that way so long because they just want to surprise fans that that's what they do. And I, I've i talked to so many people. There's actually a fan. I He talked me into doing one of my, my SWA virtual uh, conference calls with a fan rather than a worker. And I've told him, well, I'll give it a go. If it goes well, I might do more. And it did. He was a nice guy. But I talked to him. It's like, to me, surprising someone shouldn't be the, wow, I didn't see that coming and I have no idea why it happened. To me, the surprise, and I've mentioned this here before, surprise should always be, I didn't know it was going to happen that minute. And like two of my favorite turns of all time, Savage on Hogan, which we're watching with the Saturday Night's main events. It's like everyone knew Savage was turning. You just didn't know when. And when it did, you're like, oh, shit. And then the other uh, that I really thought was fantastic was the Dave Batista turn babyface against Evolution. And again, it was months that everyone knew Dave was going to finally snap and not put up with Hunter's shit anymore. And you tuned in every single week because you didn't want to see it. And then they'd come up with a reason why it didn't happen. You like, didn't oh, want to miss it. You didn't want to miss it. So it drew week after week because you wanted to see the shit happen. And then again, when it did happen, maybe you were surprised because it was like, oh, it's tonight. Great. But you knew it was happening. And to me, that's the key of good wrestling is. Create a situation I really, really want to see. Convince me it's going to be awesome. Convince me it's coming up and I'm going to pay to see it or tune in to see it. And again, I think AEW did that very well for with, you know, the the Bucks and FTR. It's like, shit, they weren't even in the same company yet and they were building that shit up. And it's like everybody wanted to see it. Everybody wanted to see it. They didn't swerve us. They just gave us the fucking match and said, hey, this will be great. Tune in and watch it. And almost without i don't know i don't know i didn't hear anyone that said anything other than it was great it was what i wanted and we're happy about it and and i don't like when there's no motivation behind a turn i I, again we'll skip ahead to dynamite here i don't know if he did or not but it felt like lance archer turned i have no idea why i think matt hardy turned i have no idea why now the hob hobbs one i think was pretty good in that I didn't have a big emotional attachment to Hobbs yet. He was fairly new. He's a big guy. He seemed pretty decent. And Taz was making the offer, hey, come join us. He never said no. He seemed to be thinking about it. Then it seemed like he wasn't thinking about it. But again, we don't know, and that's perfectly fine. Was he late on purpose saving some of the guys from their beatdowns? Or was it a case of he tried to get there on time and couldn't and realized that, you know, this Taz and his crew is a step ahead of these other guys. I'd rather get on the winning team. Screw these other guys. And I think since there wasn't huge motivation, it's fine because I didn't have a huge emotional attachment to Will Hobbs, the babyface. I just kind of liked him, thought he had some potential. We'll see where he goes. So I don't need a giant story and a gigantic motivation for him turning. But when he did, I'm like, all right, well, Taz tried to convince him to join. Guy decided to take him up on the offer. It's like, I can relate to that. And now, Not only that, but I mean, as somebody noted when they sent in an email to Observer Live, it's like, now that he's turned, if you go back and watch all of those shows when Taz was trying to recruit him, every time he tried to make the save for the baby faces, he was always late. They'd already taken their beating. You never listen to me, do you? He always runs in. Why? Well, it was actually, I had a very important uh, thing that I had to. Yeah, because I had just I'll tell explained you all of this. You I did? just explained okay. all this. Well, I apologize. <laughs> I'll tell you off air. But anyway, go ahead. But it was just that you can look back and go, was he late on purpose? 
Or was it a case of he tried to make it on time but realized that Team Taz was always a step ahead of, you know, Darby and the other guys? So it's like... I feel like I just said this. Well, yes, but that's what I... same page. Well, I'm telling you what I had said while you were dealing with the other shit. But, But that's fine in that we don't need to know which it was, but... You can think it either way. Both make perfect sense. And since, again, it's not like Will Hobbs had, you know, a six-year run as a babyface. We think he's the salt of the earth. And it's like, what the hell was the motivation of joining Team Taz? The dude asked you. That was it. That would be dumb. But we don't have six years invested in Will Hobbs. We've got, like, two or three weeks and a few dark matches if you watched it. So the level of motivation for his turn is perfectly acceptable. And then now their job is to, you know, get heat on him. Which, again, I think they will. This is probably so, what you just said, Lance, because I don't listen a lot. But when you compare it to, like, the Tony Storm thing, Tony Storm had just returned. And you could have done so much with her as a baby face before turning her. Oh, Jesus, yes. It was like, she just came back. She's super over. What's the point of immediately turning her? Will Hobbs... I mean, if you just watch Dynamite, you never even saw Will Hobbs before. One day, Will Hobbs shows up. He has a match, whatever. I mean, he can start out as a babyface or a heel. He can turn babyface later now that he's turned heel. It doesn't matter. It's not like there was so much upside with Will Hobbs as a babyface. Why did you turn him so early? Maybe there is. Maybe there isn't. We don't know. He just got there. But with Tony or... or I mean, She's actually the best example because they just did it. Why would you not run with her as a babyface coming back for at least a few months... Then pull the trigger on the turn. I, I agree completely because I, I, you know, Tony has been off and on WWE television for a while. She's always been a babyface. She's always been over. She's always been great. But, but that's too. And and we'll get to sort of difference in booking and level of emotional attachment. And I think that's where you tried to explain. I don't think you did it as well. But the the top flight thing, where again. You know, you just said AEW books differently, so don't judge, you know, them losing their first two matches by WWE booking standards. But again, I think there's a very important difference in that AEW presented them the first time as, hey, here's two indie guys that the, the Bucks saw and thought had some potential. So we have no investment in them whatsoever. It's like, I don't know who these fucking guys are. They're just two kids. And then they come on, and that's it. My expectations are down here. It's like, okay, the Bucks said they thought they saw something in them, but they're two kids I've never seen before. And then they have this match with the Bucks, where the Bucks present them as like, holy shit, these two new kids are, you know, they're in the same league as the Young Bucks. They didn't beat them. They're not as good as the Young Bucks. Young Bucks are the best team in AEW. They're the world tag champs. They've been, you know, the team forever. So it's like, okay, they're less than the Young Bucks, but it's like losing to the Young Bucks in that match moved them up like 15 spots in my vision of their value because I went from, who the hell are these two kids, to, holy shit, these kids were pretty damn exciting and held their own with the best tag team in AEW, where often what happens, and we'll get back to their second match, but in WWE quite often, this is where... Some people will say, oh, they're being buried. We talk about the three weeks where if you bring them in that first time and you present them as a big star and then that second week they get a big win and then that third week they lose, that loss is bringing them down and decreasing their value where Top Flight had next to zero value on that first Dynamite show. And then after having an exciting, good, competitive match with the Young Bucks, it's like, shit, these guys got value. And even again, week two now with uh, Angelico and Jack Evans, they're still just young kids that we're excited to see. And then they come out and have another good, exciting match. And it's where when you start them as you're new and you go, it's the um, New Japan Young Lions theory. When you're a young lion, you lose all the time. Everybody just expects it because you're new. You're starting out. And that's where, again, the announcers did a really good job. Um, JR hit it up several times where, you know, again, they've got a cover and those shoulders aren't really covered. And they're like inexperience. You know what I mean? They're putting the emphasis on their offense and stuff, but they're not doing the little things that you're going to learn over time, picks you up some wins. So they're putting over the fact that these kids are just new. You know what I mean? And, you know, yeah, they do it with um, with Jungle Boy and, and other guys. It's like, it's okay if the presentation at the beginning is they're earning their stripes, they're working their way up. 
But if you bring them in and go, hey, they're equal with everybody, and then they start losing, then they do this. And it's really, it's a different booking approach, but it's something that really works. And on that, I wanted to mention, because it was something that well, I was Let me say one wishing- other thing, one other thing about Top Flight. The other thing, too, is they came in billed as two indie guys, and they're getting a shot against the AEW World Tag Team Champions. Nobody should have expected them to win that match. It doesn't make any sense. But they went in there and they were impressive. So even though they lost, you were like impressed with them. But you saw the match and you weren't surprised at all by the finish. In the second match, even though they lost, they like dominated that match. And so even though they were beaten in the end, as a viewer, you're watching it and you kind of are feeling... Well, obviously, they're not good enough to beat the World Tag Team Champions, but fuck, they almost beat Angelico and Jack Evans. And so already they've gone from, in two weeks, two indie guys that sent a DM to Matt Jackson to all of a sudden two guys that are almost on the level of a Jack Evans and an Angelico, even though they lost. So really, they were elevated in both of those matches in actually two different ways. It's actually a, it's a, it's a phrase uh, Bubba, Bubba Ray likes to use. They weren't put over, but they got over. Yes. And and that's the thing. It's like, after watching them in those two matches, I would imagine, I was, and I imagine everyone else was, your core emotion is, I'd like to see more. Because I think they have potential. And, like, that's perfect. And it gets back to our, it's not time yet. It's like, it's not time for them to be in the world title picture. They've got shit going on. They still have the revival right there. they got the young... It's like... They've got a lot of important, big, experienced tag teams whose time is now. And what are these kids, like 19 and 21 or something? Yeah. It's like, shit. It's like they can slowly rise over the next couple of years, and it's like their time can be down the road. And it's better to gradual build and make people want it. And again, this is back to where I mentioned about surprise and everything else. It's like, make us want something. Tease us for a while. Build to it. And it's like, if you want to see top flight winning big matches and maybe actually becoming champs it's like don't worry we've got lots of time keep watching and and you'll be rewarded but this is where the one other thing i think they could have really protected them of when angelico had the you have a heel hook i think but again it was a heel hook or knee bar some kind of leg submission that he had on the kid that tapped out and i was really hoping one of the announcers would have put over how smart it was for the top flight kid to tap that they're just getting their feet wet here in AEW young guys like this don't want to risk ligament or tendon damage in a knee or an ankle this early in their career. They can live to fight another day. You don't want to destroy your momentum by being on the shelf for six to eight months, rehabbing, you know, a torn ligament in your knee. That was really smart for that kid to tap right there. You know what I mean? The day that he's fighting for the World Tag Team Championship, maybe you risk the injury, but he's new here. Keep the momentum going. Smart move by tapping out. And it's like, I think they could have even protected them more. All right. We're virtually out of time here, but I must ask you about one more topic, Lance. And that is Lana, the sole survivor. (laughs) Yeah, it's... I don't understand, and and not even just her, it's being proud of a meaningless accomplishment. Like, I I don't know who they're targeting as her fan base that can be proud of that. Like, you can tell a story where she, and again, your, your analogy was the best. And to be honest, what I was thinking would have been good, because again, I would have put Bianca over as a sole survivor too. It's like... Get down to Bianca against the World Women's Tag Team Champions. Have her in there holding her own. It's like, I would have had Lana double-cross Shayna to allow Bianca to beat uh, Shayna. And then I would have, again, had Lana contribute some way into getting Bianca to get the better of... uh, of, um, I'm drawing a blank on... Naya, um, Naya, yeah, Naya Jax, not getting the advantage on Naya. And you could have had Bianca, who's a babyface, 
realize that Lana's been bullied and treated like shit, and Lana kind of helped her out with the two bullies, that once she'd bumped Naya to the floor, she could have looked at Lana and said, hey, girl, here's your chance. Bianca could have put Naya on the table. Lana could have then crashed and burned and put Naya through the table, allowing Bianca to pick up the win on Naya. And again, you either have Lana sell the bump and get counted out for her final elimination too, and and Bianca wins. Or again, to be perfectly honest, it's like, you know, once he, she puts her through the table, B, uh, Bianca could have thrown Naya in, pinned Naya, and looked at Lana, and Lana could have even just said, you know, I'll stay out here, one, two, you know, get counted out, and she wins. It's like she accomplished the feat she wanted. She got back at the bully. She put Naya through the table. Bianca wins. But just standing there and winning, it's like, you know, that's that's the kind of win that Miz gets and brags about because Miz is a douche. But for the baby face to be proud, and they, they even did it on Raw with Keith Lee, in my opinion. When Keith Lee won via, you know, DQ when uh, MVP kicked him in the back. They didn't acknowledge it, but it was seen behind. If you watch when when MVP's on the floor, being pissed off, Keith Lee gets in the ring and does his bask in my glory. Look how great I am, and I'm like, I wouldn't be proud of that one, dude. Well, I, I see what you're talking about with that one, but at least to somewhat defend that, I mean, the finish was Lashley's going for his move that beats everybody, he and Keith Lee fell back and just crushed him to death. He had and that's when M MVP ran in. So really, like Keith Lee, he had, had him in a sleeper. Was it the sleeper? I thought he was going for. He the had him in a full sleeper, Nelson. and they did, and they did a double down. Well, one way, well, because he crushed him. At least Keith had done something to cause MVP to run in. Lana stood there. I mean, it was as bad. I thought you were going to talk about on Raw where Lana's getting choked unconscious, and her partner rolls a girl up and pins her, and then Lana's like, "Yeah, we won." I'm like, "You were dead." You were dead when your partner got the win, and you're celebrating? And, again, it, it was an ad lib, but, again, I don't get it, but you mentioned it. It was the, the, the New Day it was New Day Hurt Business when they, they had the double count out. Yeah. The heels who had won with a bullshit count out, because they did say that they won by count out. The heels went, I don't want a cheap victory. I want a real win. And it's like, why didn't Keith Lee want a real win? Why doesn't Lana want a real win? Why don't baby faces want real wins? The heels do. And, and it's just, it hurts my emotional attachment to the characters because I, I think it, it was years ago, but on the show I mentioned it. It's, it's one of the moments in wrestling burned in my head. And because I was always a body guy, I was a mark for the road wars, I loved the big jacked up guys, and I hadn't seen NWA and I see Dusty Rhodes, I'm like, why do people like Dusty Rhodes? And then I started getting NWA tapes. And this one moment, uh, J.J. Dillon had been screwing all the baby faces, smacking them with the heel of his dress shoe to help Flair win. And there's the match. I'm pretty sure it's Flair and Dusty. And they're getting down to the thing. And, you know, J.J. throws a shoe in but gets bumped. And Dusty picks up that shoe and he looks at Ric Flair. And he's justified. Eight ways to Sunday, Dusty is justified smacking this son of a bitch with the shoe. And Dusty looks at the shoe, he throws it over his shoulder, and bionic elbows Ric Flair, and I jumped out of my seat going, that's a baby face! That's why I liked Dusty Rhodes, because Dusty Rhodes was a hero. He was justified in taking a shortcut, but didn't because he could win clean. And I don't understand why so many baby faces today aren't that way, and even more dumbfounded if heels are that way. To me, and again, maybe I'm too old, maybe, you know, the the Austin era changed all that, but, you know, to me as a babyface, be proud of a meaningful win. And again, for Lana, she just needs to put Nia through a table, and it's like, that's, that's Nia's comeuppance, that's Lana's moral victory. So, I, I don't know, but... The ironic thing is, old people like us just think that the good guys should be heroes... And the bad guys should be villains. And WWE has it completely ass backwards. And their main audience is people older than both of us. What's going on? Yeah. Newsflash. Dusty Rose was a great baby face. He in was case an you awesome weren't sure. Baby face, yes. Yes.
All right, we're out of time, everybody. But hey, fear not. Lance and I are going to be here next Friday. We can talk about more of this stuff, whatever's going on in the world of wrestling. If you listen to this before midnight Eastern on Friday, November 27th, head up there to WrestlingObserver.com, our Black Friday special, $3.99. Full month, unlimited, all the shows, all the archives, everything. You're going to regret it. If you don't do this, you're going to regret it when Saturday comes along. So head up there and check it out. And Lance, any other plugs you want to get in before we go? Yes, tomorrow, 1 Eastern, I'm doing a virtual meet and greet, uh, autograph signing. Uh, there's details on my Twitter. Um, again, I don't have the details in my head. Dude sent me a link and the graphic and stuff, but they are on my Twitter. Uh, a meet and greet, uh, autograph signing uh, tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern. I don't know how long I'm doing it. I think like three hours or something. Uh, also, SWA Virtual, online video uh, virtual coaching uh, and training from me. Uh, there's information. Uh, you can go to stormwrestling.com, click the links, you'll see it there. Um, or, again, just send me uh, an email, training at gmail.com for personal one-on-one -on -one Zoom training. Uh, so far, I've been doing uh, match watchbacks. Send me the match ahead of time. I watch it, make all my notes. I send you my notes. We schedule the Zoom call. Then we watch it online together, going over everything I, I discussed in my notes. And then, again, discuss the match further, talk wrestling, and wrap up. It's a one-hour Zoom call. So SWA Virtual. Uh, you can check that out, stormwrestling.com. Follow me on Twitter, at Lance Storm. And again, tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern, I'm doing a live meet-and-greet virtual signing info, at Lance Storm on Twitter. At Lance Storm on Twitter. Oh, there, there's a sale on Pro Wrestling Tees at the moment, too. Holy smokes. Yes. All right, check so. it out. PWTs. Lance has got shirts up there. We got shirts up there. What's 25% off? What is it? I don't even know right now. 10%? It's either, it's either 20 or 40. I've Holy seen smokes. You kidding me? All right. PWTs.com, everybody. Check that out. And hey, we are out of time. Thanks, Lance, as always. Thank you all for listening. We'll talk to you again after a while. Adios.